Hey Dublin Pal Youth, welcome back on another first day of the week. Last week we were introduced to David, God's chosen successor to the rebellious king Saul, who rebelled against God's plan for his kingdom and endangered all of Israel in the process. This week we're going to discuss King David's reign in chapter 12, Trials of a King. Uh, today is Sunday, June 7th, 2020. Let's get into it. One day, King David was walking around the roof of his palace and saw a woman bathing in her home. Her name was Bathsheba, the wife of a soldier named Uriah, who was off fighting in the war. David thought she was beautiful and sent his messengers to get her. They brought her to him and David and Bathsheba slept with one another. Shortly after, Bathsheba sent word to David that she was pregnant with David's child. To hide what he had done, David quickly devised a plan. He called Uriah back from the war, hoping that he would sleep with Bathsheba, and it would look like he had gotten her pregnant. But when Uriah came home, he slept on a mat outside his house because he didn't want to disrespect his fellow soldiers still at war by living comfortably while he was at home. So David came up with another plan. He sent Uriah back to the battlefield and instructed the commander to put Uriah on the front lines of battle where he was most likely to be killed. And that's exactly what happened. Shortly after, David married Bathsheba and she gave birth to their son. But God was unhappy with David and sent Nathan to tell him a story. There were two men, one rich and one poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little lamb who was like a child to him. Now a guest comes to the home of the rich man, but instead of taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal, the rich man steals the poor man's one sheep and kills it. David was furious. This man must die for what he has done, David said. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. David immediately realized how wrong he had been and confessed to Nathan and to God all of the things he had done. Even though God forgave David, there were still terrible consequences because of his actions. David and Bathsheba's infant son became sick and died. Then, years later, their second son, Absalom, did something no one, even David, expected. He gathered an army together to overthrow his father as king. Before the battle began, David gave instructions to his soldiers not to kill Absalom. But during the battle, Absalom was riding a mule under the thick branches of a large oak tree and his hair got caught in the tree, leaving him hanging as the mule rode away. One of David's commanders, Joab, found Absalom, and despite David's instructions, he and his soldiers drove their spears through Absalom and killed him. Because of this, David was heartbroken. Even after these tragedies, David continued to worship God. He had not forgotten about God's promise to one day build the temple. So David told his son, Solomon, that he was to start building it. In his final days as king, David led the Israelites in worship of God for all of the ways that God had helped them and provided for them over the years. Then, shortly before his death, David handed over his kingship to Solomon. All right, so our first new chapter of the story uh, in several months uh, covering King David's rule. Uh, I want to say right off the bat what our text kind of skips over pretty quickly. 
um, are some of David's uh, finest years. He's a successful young king. He unites the entire nation of Israel uh, and leads them as, as God's anointed king. In fact, David so sincerely seeks the Lord uh, that God makes him this promise in 2 Samuel 7. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them any more, as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all of your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Unfortunately, David did not stay faithful to the Lord throughout his reign. Our text started off this week uh, after the introduction with the idea that something was off. Uh, it says, quoting Second Samuel 11, 1, that in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. This David does not seem like the bold young man who chastised the whole Israelite army for allowing Goliath to talk smack and then volunteered to King Saul to face him himself. The rainy season has ended and armies can effectively march to do battle again. But David sends out his forces to fight the Ammonites and remained in Jerusalem. He is no longer putting his duty to God and his people first, but rather his own desires. He doubles down on serving his own desires when he sees Bathsheba from his rooftop. David was very attracted to her and asked who she was. He was told that she was Bathsheba, daughter of one of David's trusted advisors, and wife to Uriah, one of his loyal officers. David sent for her to be brought to him and took her to his bed. While not much information about the nature of that first interaction is provided in the scriptures, it's safe to say that no woman brought before the king because he desired her was in a position to refuse him. Engaging in sex with someone who cannot say no is rape. And that's exactly what David did with Bathsheba. As a result of her rape at David's hands, Bathsheba became pregnant, and David worked hard to cover up his crimes. Bringing her husband Uriah home to give a report uh, and hoped that he would lay with his wife while he was home so that the baby could reasonably be thought to be Uriah's. Uriah, however, didn't sleep with her, as the men of Israel, at <laughs> David's direction, abstained from sex during military campaigns because it made them ritually unclean. Uh, this was first seen in, in 1 Samuel 21.5. Uriah's response, when David suggests he go home and enjoy himself while he's in town, shows a direct contrast between Uriah's actions and David's actions. 2 Samuel 11.11 says, Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. So David decides to cover up his crime another way. He plots for Uriah's murder. Not even willing to kill him himself, David gives orders for Uriah to be sent into heavy fighting and then abandoned, using the enemies of Israel to cover his crimes. David then takes Bathsheba as his wife. So far, it looks like David's path is following the same trajectory that Saul's did. He has gone from God's anointed king to someone who openly sins and then uses their power to cover it up. However, things change when God sends Nathan to confront David. This is where David and Saul's paths diverge, because when David sees plainly the terrible things he's done, 
David repents of his sins, and he's given forgiveness. In 2 Samuel 12, 13, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. He admitted fault. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. Even though God shows David grace, his actions still have consequences. The child conceived by David's rape of Bathsheba gets sick and dies. And sometime later, another of David's sons, Absalom, leads a revolt against his father, the king. David is greatly troubled at the idea of fighting his own son, and he instructs the officers of his armies to not harm Absalom for David's sake. However, Absalom is captured and killed by Joab, one of David's highest ranking generals. David mourns for his sons, but he continues to praise the Lord. This is the primary difference between the hearts of David and Saul. When Saul's wickedness was exposed, he became more paranoid, rebellious, and proud. When David's wickedness was exposed, he repented, received grace, and praised God more fervently because of the grace that he had received. David spent most of the rest of his life preparing for the construction of the temple, where God would reside among his people, even though the Lord told David that the temple would not be his to build. In 1 Chronicles 22, starting in verse 8, it says, But the word of the Lord came to me. You have shed much blood and fought in many wars. You are not to build a house for my name, because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. But you will have a son who will be a man of peace and rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies on every side. His name will be Solomon. And I will grant Israel peace and quiet during his reign. He is the one who will build a house for my name. He will be my son, and I will be his father. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. David was a warring king and a sinful king. But God made peace so that Solomon could be a king of peace and rest. And build the temple that his father never could. David continued his preparations until he was very near death until his wife Bathsheba told him, it's time, and he handed over the throne to his son. So now that we're back into the story, uh, where is Jesus in all of this? The answer is he's all over it. First of all, David is an incomplete precursor for Jesus. Ruling over God's kingdom on earth as well as any man can, unfortunately for David, he proves that being the ruler of God's kingdom requires more than any human could possibly handle, pointing to our need for Jesus, for a complete savior, for a complete king, for a king who could fulfill the law uh, and, and lead well. Additionally, Jesus is mentioned right at the beginning of this story in a pretty important piece that wasn't actually in the text in your books. 2 Samuel 7.16, like I read, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And is mentioned again in 1 Chronicles 22.10, when it says, I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. God kept his promise to David, but not in the form of an unbroken Israelite dynasty that rules forever. No, God kept his promise to David through Jesus who came from the house of David and who now and forever rules over God's kingdom. You see, when you go through the whole Bible, it all points to Jesus, the ultimate act of grace followed by the establishment of God's kingdom, which is for everyone who puts their faith in him, repents and is baptized. All of these things were like shadows of the fullness that arrived with Christ. So we saw a lot happen in David's life this week. When he was confronted with his sin, David submitted himself to God and repented. God chose to show mercy and grace to David. And that choice is why David was called a man after God's own heart. Not because he always did the right thing, but because when he saw what he had become, he threw himself on the mercy of the Lord rather than trying to fix things on his own. And next week, we'll be getting into Solomon's reign and see some parallels 
and some differences to David. I have no new resources this week, but make sure you check out the ones listed in the description that you haven't already. Uh, it's great to be rocking and rolling in our study of the story again. Looking forward to getting into Solomon next week. And uh, let me pray for us before we go. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you that we can repent of our sins and in Jesus' name we can be washed clean. Thank you for Jesus, that he would die on the cross in our place so that we could receive your grace abundantly. Please show us areas in our lives where we are blind to our sin like David was, so that we can repent and come back to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining me this week, y'all. It's great to be progressing through the story again. Grace and peace. I see the world in light. I see the world in wonder. I see the world in life bursting in living color.